In the previous video, we showed how a steady state process model could be used to derive a feed forward control law, and we did this using the example of a blending tank. Now let's consider a dynamic process model for a process using feed forward control with feedback trim. The block diagram for feed forward control with feedback trim is shown here, where the lower part of this block diagram looks just like our standard feedback control loop, except that between the controller and the valve we have a sum operation and we're summing the signal from the feedback controller with another signal from a feed forward controller. The feed forward controller of course measures a disturbance, so we have a disturbance sensor transmitter function and that measured value of the disturbance is sent to the feed forward controller which decides what its signal should be to send to the valve. In addition to being measured, of course that disturbance also has its own transfer function whereby it affects the controlled variable Y. This is the same GD that we had in our standard feedback control loop. So the only things that we've added here are the transfer function for the disturbance sensor, the feed forward controller, and the summation in between the feedback controller and the control valve. Now that we've added this feed forward controller to our feedback loop, we should consider what the regulator transfer function looks like. The regulator transfer function has the same denominator that it would have for the standard feedback control loop, one plus the open loop transfer function. But now this disturbance has two forward paths between D and Y. One forward path goes through GD, the way it does for a standard feedback loop, and the other forward path goes through these other four transfer functions, GT, GF, GV, and GP. The sum of those two contributions is the numerator of the regulator transfer function. Now an ideal feed forward controller would be designed so as to eliminate the effects of the disturbance. We can find what that ideal feed forward controller should be by setting the numerator of the regulator transfer function equal to zero. If the numerator of the regulator transfer function is zero, then the disturbance has no impact on the controlled variable. So setting this numerator to zero and solving for GF, we find that our feed forward controller ideally should be minus GD over GT, GV, GP. And that will ensure that the contribution from D going through GD, when it is added to the contribution of D coming through the feed forward control loop, sums to exactly zero. And therefore, the disturbance has no effect on the controlled variable. Now, if the process has a time delay, this is impossible because we would have an e to the minus theta s in the denominator in GP, and that e to the minus theta s in the denominator becomes an e to the theta s in the numerator of GF, which means that GF must act before the disturbance takes place. Based on this regulator transfer function, can you answer the question, how does the feed forward controller GF affect the closed loop stability of this process? This is an important question that we will return to later. You can think about it now. Before we talk about stability, let's talk more about the ideal feed forward controller design. Let's consider a case where GD is approximated by a first order transfer function. GP is also a first order transfer function and we've got negligible dynamics for the transmitter and the valve. So these behave simply as gains, KT and KV. The ideal feed forward controller for this case has a minus sign multiplying this ratio of the gains and the tau P S plus one in the numerator from this term and the tau D S plus one in the denominator from this term. Therefore, the ideal feed forward controller is a lead lag element. Now, how about the case where our process is an FOPTD model? We still have a first order model for the disturbance and negligible dynamics for the transmitter and the valve. In this case, the ideal feed forward controller would be something like a lead lag element multiplied by e to the theta s. Now, this e to the theta s is the opposite of a time delay. And so that is physically 
impossible because it would require the feedforward controller to respond before the disturbance can be measured. How about a case where our disturbance is a first order transfer function and our process is a second order transfer function? In this case, the ideal controller has a second order numerator and a first order denominator. This is also physically unrealizable. Although we can write down the equation, it's not physically possible to design a controller that has a numerator transfer function that has a higher order in S than the denominator. To understand why, you have to write the equivalent time domain differential equation describing this system. So for these two cases, which we determined were both physically unrealizable, we need to make approximations. For example, in the case where we have the opposite of a time delay, we can simply add theta to tau p and make that a larger time constant in the numerator. Similarly, for the case where we've got the second order numerator combined with the first order denominator, we can just add the time constants. Now both of these are lead lag elements. You can answer the question what the steady state gain of the feed forward controller should be. In the next video, we'll design several feed forward control schemes for a process and we'll plug some numbers in so we can see how these types of feed forward controllers behave.